Well, obesity is very simple to understand. It means eating more calories than you need uh, to maintain your life. So people are eating more. And there's now more and more evidence that the introduction of ultra-processed foods into Brazil and other countries uh, encourages people to eat more. There's research that shows that the main effect of ultra-processed foods is to encourage eating more calories. You're just eating more food in general. Uh, and that alone is an explanation for why people are gaining weight. Well, the, if you look at the causes of obesity, um, as I said, the main one is eating too much and eating, usually eating too much of ultra-processed foods. The one that is most easy to study and most easy to understand is sugar-sweetened beverages because sugary drinks have sugars and water and nothing else of nutritional value, and they are consumed by some people in very, very large amounts, liters a day. Um, sugars have calories, and if you are taking in extra calories, they're not good for you, and there is an enormous amount of circumstantial evidence that links consumption of sugary beverages with developing obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, can you say that sugar-sweetened beverages cause that? Not if they're consumed in very small amounts. It's really only the large amounts that are a problem, but lots of people consume sugary drinks in large amounts. Well, if we want to do something about obesity and type 2 diabetes, we really need public policies to stop those diseases from occurring. And this means putting some controls on the food industry. It means front of package labeling. It means other education campaigns to explain to the public that ultra-processed foods should only be consumed in small amounts, if at all, and that they really should be eating real foods. It means making the cost of real foods less expensive so that everyone can afford them. It means putting some restrictions on food food industry marketing of ultra-processed foods. Um, and these kinds of policies will have a big effect on what people choose to eat. Well, one way to look at trying to encourage people not to drink so much sugar-sweetened beverages is to tax them. That will raise the price and there is good evidence that higher prices discourage consumption. And the benefits of taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages are twofold. They stop people from drinking the beverages, that's their purpose, or they discourage consumption. And then also, if the revenues can be used for public health purposes, and that's also, uh, that could be very helpful. I think large food companies are worried about two kinds of regulations. First, they don't want taxes. And in the United States, they don't want taxes so much that they are willing to put hundreds of millions of dollars into fighting any tax initiative that comes up even in the smallest town, even tiny towns. Uh, that don't where not even that much soda is sold, if they're proposing a tax, the soda industry will send many millions of, will spend many millions of dollars to try to defeat it. The other one, the other regulation that they really don't want is a restriction on marketing to children. Um, there, the fight back against restrictions on marketing to children is so great that Nobody in the United States has tried this for 40 years. 40 years ago, there was one attempt to put limits on marketing of junk foods to children. And the person who, who proposed it lost his job, and Congress passed a law that you could not ever stop the, f the food industry from marketing to children. Um, so that's the industry's line in the sand, because if they can't market to children, they won't make money. 
the food industry loves the little tiny guideline da daily amounts that are on food packages because nobody understands them. They are completely incomprehensible to the general public. Nobody looks at them, nobody pays attention to them. Warning labels are well documented to have an effect. They've, there's much research that shows that the warning labels in Chile um, have been very well understood by children, by people who cannot read, um, and by the general public whereas these other things nobody understands at all. And there is now excellent research information that the triangle that has been suggested in Brazil uh, is very well understood and much better understood than some of these other mechanisms. So it would be very helpful in explaining to people, even to children, what kinds of products should be avoided. Obviously, the industry is opposed to them because it doesn't want people to avoid their products. The industry's first responsibility is to sell its products. The food industry, like any other industry, has one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to sell more products. Food companies are not social service agencies, they're not public health agencies, and they shouldn't be looked at as such. They are businesses whose primary responsibility is to make profits for their shareholders. And in order to protect that goal, they use what we call the tobacco industry playbook, which is a set of strategies that the tobacco industry used to try to deflect attention from the role of tobacco in causing lung cancer. And the playbook strategies include things like focusing on personal responsibility. It's your fault if you smoke or if you eat junk food. Um, they fund research, which is the subject of my book, uh, in order to get research results that they can use for marketing purposes. They argue in favor of self-regulation. We can take care of our own regulation. Don't regulate us. Um, and then they lobby behind the scenes to make sure that no government agency passes any unfavorable rules. Well, the, the soda industry, obviously, does not want taxes because taxes would discourage consumption. And their job is to get people to drink more sodas, not fewer. So they argue that it's a matter of personal responsibility. It's not our fault if you drink a lot of these things. Um, that the taxes really won't do any good. That sodas are only a small part of calorie intake and therefore they're not such a problem. But there's so much evidence now that suggests that people who drink a large amount of sugar-sweetened beverages uh, have a much greater risk for becoming obese and developing type 2 diabetes, that at this point, you really can't argue that the science isn't there. The science is there. The soda companies just don't want you to believe it. I wanted to write about how the food industry finances research because there is so much evidence that research that is financed by a particular company comes out with exactly the results that that company would hope for. And the, the research on industry funding shows this for the tobacco industry, for the drug industry, for the chemical industry, and also for the food industry. That when Coca-Cola, for example, funds research studies, it funds studies that are designed to demonstrate that sugar-sweetened beverages have no effect on obesity or type 2 diabetes, that any research that suggests a connection between sugary drinks and health problems is so badly designed that 
you don't have to pay any attention to it. And that really physical activity is more important than what you eat in development of obesity. I think physical activity is very important, but when it comes to obesity, diet matters more. And so the, what the research shows is that the people who take the money from Coca-Cola to do research don't realize how they are being influenced by the funding. They think they're just doing science and they can't understand why people like me are saying, you're being influenced. Look at your results. Your results are clear enough and there's so much evidence that industry funded research comes out with these kinds of results that nobody's even arguing about it anymore. Well, conflicts of interest are very difficult to solve. The easiest way to solve them is just not take the money. If you're a researcher, don't take money from food companies, then you have no conflict of interest and no problem about it. If you do take money from the food industry, you are putting yourself in a position where you may be influenced in ways that you're not conscious of. So you must take very, very careful steps to prevent the bias from being there. But if you do that, you won't produce the result. There's a good chance you won't produce the results that the company is paying for. Uh, so best, it's, if you can, just don't take the money. It solves a lot of problems. So much of the research on conflicts of interest and the influence of industry funding has come from industries other than the food industry. It's come from the tobacco industry, the chemical industry. Um, the chemical industry would include the makers of genetically modified foods and agrochemicals. Um, and there, the research is very clear that these companies have attempted in every way possible to influence the outcome of research. There have been many, many studies of this influence and also recent studies looking at email exchanges between the companies and the researchers demonstrating that the companies are designing the studies, asking the research question, manipulating how the studies are conducted, how they're interpreted, and also refusing to publish the results of studies that come out with answers that they don't like. We're seeing the same kind of thing uh, in food industry studies. Thank you.